Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Hello, June. Summer is in the air, and this is the month where we will all see pride flags waving high. So for today's story, I chose a case that has been highly requested And it's an international case, an American Marine behaving badly while on liberty in another country. And the thing with these cases are that Americans already tend to act a little bit stupid when they're drinking in other countries. They fail to respect the laws of other countries and the locals tend to really hate it. But what happens when an American kills a local and appears to be protected by the military? Is it justice or something else? I will leave the debate up to you, so I plan on sticking just to the facts, and you let me know what you think. Join me today as I tell you the tragic story of Philippine national Jennifer Laude. Now, let's dig in. In June of 2014, the USS Peleliu, an amphibious assault ship transporting U.S. Marines, well, it set out on a six-month-long deployment into the Western Pacific. After port calls in Hawaii, Guam, and Japan, the Peleliu set sail to Subic Bay, which is in the Republic of the Philippines. They were deploying there to join up with a contingent of 3,500 troops for a joint U.S.-Philippine amphibious landing exercise called FIBLEX for short. Now, I don't know if that's actually how you say that acronym, but I'm sorry. Anyway, this all happened in late September 2014. By October 11th, they had called NDEX for the exercise, and the sailors and Marines assigned to the Peleliu were granted liberty to go ashore and blow off some steam. Now, NDEX indicates the end of the exercise. Four young Marines hit the town starting at the Harbor Point Mall to grab some food. The guys' names were Joseph Scott Pemberton, B. Dahl, D. Pulido, and Jaron Rose. The mall was part of the former U.S. naval base in Subic Bay. Subic, along with Clark Air Force Base, had been closed since 1992 when a volcanic eruption forced the evacuation of American troops from the island and closure of the bases. After the four guys ate and shopped at the mall, the four headed about a mile outside of the former base in Alangapo City to the Willis Bar where they spent about three hours drinking. When they left the Willis Bar, they headed to Ambayant's Nightlight Bar. The ambiance was known as a place where guys, particularly foreigners, could hook up with sex workers. Two girls who were there working that night were Jennifer Laude and Barbie Galviro. The women had been in the club all day with three other sex workers named Gorgeous, Jamil, and Charisse. The five women were all transgender. They had been born male, but were living and working as women. An article in the Stars and Stripes described how in the 80s and 90s, American troops would often receive briefings about transgender people when they arrived in ports in Southeast Asia. And because of this, condoms were often handed out freely before liberty was granted. So it may have been common knowledge and common practice back in the day to hire sex workers, transgender or not. But in 2005, Article 134 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice expanded to include prostitution and pandering, making it illegal to hire sex workers. Anyway, Jennifer had been kind of on and off in the sex trade industry, and she hadn't worked in that industry in months because she had been receiving a regular allowance from her fiancé, a German citizen by the name of Mark Susselbeck. Jennifer was actually supposed to be in Germany with Mark on October 1st, But Germany had denied her visa several times, causing them to push back the trip. The visa had recently been approved, but they had not made any travel arrangements at the time. At any rate, for reasons only known to herself, Jennifer had decided that she would take on some clients on this particular day. At about 10.45 p.m., 19-year-old Private First Class Joseph Scott Pemberton, one of the four Marines that were out partying that night, Well, he headed out with 26-year-old Jennifer Laude. 
along with Joseph and Jennifer, was Jennifer's friend Barbie. The trio walked across the street from the club to the Cell Zone Lodge, which the Stars and Stripes refers to a seedy hotel. Joseph, Jennifer, and Barbie stopped at the front desk where the two women spoke to the receptionist, a man by the name of Elias Galamos. They asked for an available room and Elias sent them to room one, which was on the second floor. Barbie went up with them and stayed with the couple long enough for Jennifer and Joseph to agree on a rate for oral sex. Jennifer wanted 5,000 pesos, which is about 100 US dollars. But Joseph didn't want to pay that and he said he would give her 1,000 pesos, which is about 25 US dollars. Jennifer was nervous. Both she and Barbie were transgender and Barbie didn't have breast implants yet. Jennifer did. Jennifer didn't want Joseph to notice, so she pushed Barbie towards the door. As she left, Barbie told Pemberton, you safe, my friend, to which Pemberton answered, okay. And then Jennifer closed the door behind Barbie. 30 minutes later, Joseph walked out of the motel room alone, leaving the door to room one ajar. He seemed cool, calm, and collected as he walked past Elias at the front desk and out into the street. Back at the motel, Elias, the receptionist, waited for a few minutes after Joseph left. Then he ran up to room one to clean it. When he got to the room, he noticed that the windows were open, air conditioner was still running, and the sheet was missing from the bed. He also noticed a pair of sandals outside the bathroom and figured someone must be taking a shower. He turned and left the room, pulling the door closed behind him. A few minutes later, Elias went back to room one and called out into the room to see if it was okay to enter. When no one answered, he knocked, then went into the room. Once he was inside, he discovered Jennifer's body slumped over the toilet bowl. Her hair was wet and her head was partially inside the bowl. She was naked except for a motel blanket wrapped around her body. Elias couldn't tell if she was alive or dead, so he quick ran outside, told his co-worker Jacinto Miraflor. Jacinto told Elias to go get the police and then positioned himself outside the door to ensure that no one could enter or exit. Elias ran up to room five to get Barbie and then ran a block and a half to the nearest police station. Police soon arrived on scene and shortly after they arrived, Barbie pushed her way into room one. She saw her friend Jennifer on the floor of the bathroom with her head in the toilet and asked the police if Jennifer was still alive. The police told her they couldn't tell and were waiting for an ambulance. Barbie, though, she took one look at Jennifer and she knew. She ran outside, and when she ran outside, she happened upon the three Marines that had been with Joseph Pemberton when she and Jennifer left Ambayans. She looked at the three Marines and she said, where's your friend? You know your friend killed my friend. The ambulance soon arrived, followed closely behind by a team from the Naval Criminal Investigative Service, or NCIS. They seemed to have been tipped off that an American service member may have been involved in Jennifer's death. The emergency responders pronounced Jennifer dead at the scene and her body was quickly transported from the scene. Earlier at Ambayance, a different Marine, Jaron Rose, he had also gone to a hotel with somebody else. At around 11.30 p.m., he left the hotel and started looking for the three Marines. Well, they had a curfew and Jaron worried about possible discipline if they didn't make it on time. He located Polito and Dahl but couldn't find Joseph Pemberton. The three Marines frantically looked for Joseph. That's when they ran into Barbie outside the motel and Barbie alleged the missing Marine killed her friend. The trio went into the hotel where they were told that their buddy had jumped into a taxi and left. They decided to head back to the Peleliu without Joseph. They took a cab and got back to the ship after curfew where they received a solid butt chewing from their supervisor and non-commissioned officer in charge, Corporal Christopher Miller. Well, he was on the deck smoking a cigarette. When Corporal Miller was done reading this trio, the riot act, he noticed that Joseph was missing. Then he really laid into them. The three buddies tried to explain to Corporal Miller that they had been searching for Pemberton but couldn't find him and that's why they were late. Just then, Private First Class Joseph Pemberton showed up in his very own taxi. By that point, Corporal Miller decided he would let them off with a verbal counseling and he sent them to their quarters for bed. Just before they got in their own racks, Joseph Pemberton pulled Jaron Rose aside and made a shocking confession. Joseph told his friend that he had met two girls at the bar and had gone to a motel across the street with them. After one of them left the room, the girl he was with got undressed. That's when he saw that the girl had a penis. 
Joseph said he became enraged and told Jaron that he choked it from behind. He actually called Jennifer an it. When the body went limp, he dragged the body to the bathroom and left. Jaron thought Joseph was kidding. But then Joseph said, I think I killed a he she. Jaron Rose was shocked. He didn't know what to do, but he did the right thing. He went and found someone he trusted. He went and woke up Corporal Christopher Miller and told him that Joseph Pemberton had just confessed to murder. Corporal Miller got up. He was probably like, what the hell are you talking about? He went with Jaron to the front of the ship where Joseph Pemberton was sitting in a chair. Miller sat down next to Joseph and he was like, what seems to be the issue? Joseph was quiet at first, but eventually started talking. He told Corporal Miller that I might have fucked up bad. Corporal Miller asked Pemberton, tell me exactly what you mean. But before Joseph could say another word, Jaron jumped in and regurgitated the information that Joseph had just told him. He said something about the two sex workers that he took to a motel and what happened after one of them left. Joseph finally chimed in and said he couldn't figure out what happened to the one who stayed. The corporal asked Joseph what he wanted to do and Joseph replied that he wanted to just go to sleep. Corporal Miller didn't press the matter any further. He smoked another cigarette before going back to sleep himself. True Crime Army, I want to take a minute to talk about your pets. I know that your pet is a member of your family, so why would you feed them like they're in the doghouse? Don't do that. Feed them Nom Nom. Nom Nom delivers fresh, I repeat, fresh dog food with every portion personalized to your dog's specific needs, so you can bring out the best in your pup. Nom Nom delivers nutrient-packed recipes crafted by board-certified veterinary nutritionists. The best thing about Nom Nom is that it is made with real whole food that you can see and recognize. Nom Nom leaves out all the additives and fillers that only cause your dog to have tummy problems and can contribute to low energy. And Nom Nom has been around the block, having delivered over 40 million meals to dogs just like yours, inspiring millions of clean bowls and tail rags. And listen, Jess and Russ from Wife of Crime recently used Nom Nom for their beloved four-legged children, and they cannot stop bragging about how much their pups love the meals from the minute they were served. It was as if the dogs from the Bronx were eating at a gourmet restaurant. Nom Nom is a safe bet because it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if your dog isn't wagging his tail within 30 days, simply ask for a refund. It's that simple. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Go right now for 50% off your no-risk two-week trial at trynom.com slash militarymama. That's trynom.com slash militarymama for 50% off. Trynom.com slash military mama. Go on, your dog is waiting for his next meal. The night that Jennifer was murdered, her sister Michelle was called in to make the positive identification. Sadly, Michelle notified her mother, Julita Caliban, and their other sister, Marilu. Julita lived in Leite and had to take a bus that took 24 hours to get to Alangapo City, more than 650 miles or 1,000 kilometers away. She did this to travel to be with her surviving daughters. The following day, an autopsy determined that Jennifer's cause of death was strangulation and asphyxiation by drowning. There were pressure marks between her sternum and neck that lined up with the edge of the toilet bowl. The autopsy revealed that Jennifer had been forcefully drowned in the water of the toilet bowl. Her head was held down and the toilet was flushed, causing Jennifer to inhale water instead of air. Jennifer's body had other extensive injuries. There were hematomas on her head and face, along with multiple abrasions and bruises around her face and mouth. She had abrasions on her arms, back, and legs, and her larynx was bruised. The autopsy specifically mentioned how cruel and inhumane Jennifer's murder was. The investigation was quick. Crucial evidence was gathered at the scene, including the bed sheets and two condoms recovered from the bathroom. Video surveillance clearly showed Joseph Pemberton leaving Ambayan's nightclub with Jennifer and Barbie. Jennifer's arm was looped with Pemberton's arm as they walked up the stairs on camera. On October 13th, Barbie gave a sworn statement to NCIS agents. And when she looked at two separate photo lineups, she picked out private first class Joseph Scott Pemberton. She confirmed that this was the person that her friend checked into room one with at the cell zone lodge. So this would be the part where the suspect gets picked up and brought in, right? Well, not so fast. 
This was an American service member on foreign soil. It's not so cut and dry. You see, the United States and the Republic of the Philippines have an agreement called the Visiting Forces Agreement, or the VFA. The VFA was enacted in 1998 and functions kind of like a Status of Forces Agreement, or a SOFA, for listeners who have served overseas. The VFA gives the Philippine government jurisdiction over U.S. personnel who break the law in their country. But it allows the U.S. to keep physical custody of the accused personnel until after judicial proceedings are complete. Private First Class Joseph Scott Pemberton was held on board the USS Peleliu and the U.S. Pacific Commander Admiral Samuel Locklear, well, he ordered all the other Navy ships that were there for Fiblex. I'm not sure if I said that right, but he ordered them to lock down and stay in the Philippines pending the investigation. That meant no more shore liberty for the troops on the ships. Pemberton's treatment sparked massive protests in Subic Bay and at the U.S. Embassy in Manila against the U.S. holding Pemberton instead of him being placed in Philippine prison. They also wanted the VFA to be abolished. The protesters carried signs that had justice for Jennifer written in large red letters. The signs also called for the surrender of Private First Class Pemberton to the Philippine government. There is one more thing that I want to add here as I was watching a documentary about Jennifer's case. The thing about the lockdown after Pemberton was taken into custody is that the Philippine people rely on the Americans having liberty to spend their money. That's how a lot of these people survive. So some of the Philippine people were really upset that there was a lockdown put into place. And then you have the people who didn't care. They just wanted the Americans gone. So I just wanted to add that bit here. Jennifer Lede was genetically born a male named Jeffrey. She was from Leite. Julita, Jennifer's mom, called Jennifer beautiful, specifically referring to her as Jennifer Ganda, meaning beauty. She said this because even as a little girl, Jennifer would coyly put her hands under her chin and say, I'm so pretty. When people were asked to describe Jennifer, they used words such as elegant, intelligent, leader, kind, friendly, and giving. Jennifer started dressing in feminine clothing when she hit puberty. After she finished high school, she had to wait to attend college because she really wanted to attend a college that allowed her to wear women's clothing and grow her hair long. She started college at the Asian Institute of E-Commerce, majoring in human resources. But it turned out that college wasn't her thing. So she quickly found work in a hair salon, just washing and cleaning up. While working at the hair salon, Jennifer met a British man named Jupe who fell head over heels for her. He showered her with gifts and money. Jennifer was honest with Jupe and she told him she was a trans woman. After gaining this knowledge, Jupe continued to lavish Jennifer with gifts and money. But there was a caveat. Jupe didn't want to be seen in public with Jennifer. But Jennifer wasn't about that life and the romance quickly ended. In addition to her gig at the hair salon where Jennifer was paid with food instead of money, she was also a home service beautician. Basically, she cut and dyed hair and did manicures. This job brought in about 5,000 pesos, which is equivalent to 100 U.S. dollars a week. This wasn't a ton of money, but even with that, Jennifer saved as much as she could to send back to her mom, who was still living in a small village. Before her death, Jennifer sent her mom 10,000 pesos and told her mom she was proud that if and when she ever returned back to that small village, they might not call her a queer anymore because she was out there jobbing it and making a name for herself. Jennifer understood now more than ever that her life had value. Years before her death, Jennifer began to make money from online webcamming and sex work. So let's backtrack. In 2007, Jennifer, in an effort to feel and look more feminine, she saved up for plastic surgery, breast implants to be exact. Jennifer's mom always knew that Jennifer was in the sex work industry and she was fine with it, especially because Jennifer was bringing in a lot of money and that money benefited the entire family. With the extra cash that Jennifer sent home, they were able to add on a small house to the existing house. And when a storm blew the roof right off, Jennifer stepped in to get it fixed. But Jennifer didn't just stop her generosity at her family, no. When the typhoon swept through her small hometown village, Jennifer lent her neighbors money without a deadline for when the loan was due. So let's fast forward to November 2012. Jennifer met a man online. His name was Mark Susselbeck. They were chatting on a travel chat room. From the chat room, they began to talk via Skype. 
After not too long, Mark told Jennifer that he was actually heading to the Philippines for Christmas. Before this, Mark had never seen even a picture of Jennifer. And then she sent him one. But she was completely transparent at that point, sending him a message with the picture that read, quote, I know it maybe will prevent you ever to talk with me again, but I am what people call ladyboy or shemale. But I am just a girl for those people who see me. Accept me as the girl I am or don't. It's your choice. But I am me and will be proud of who and what I am if just the right guy shares it with me at my side, end quote. This statement and picture could be a shocking revelation to some. You think you're chatting with someone with a specific anatomy and they tell you otherwise. But Mark was not phased, not one bit. He was in love with Jennifer and with that, he flew to Alangapo and on December 22nd, he proposed to Jennifer publicly on a stage at the mall in front of hundreds of people. Mark, who was living in Germany at the time, had to return home soon after the proposal but he traveled back to the Philippines twice a year to visit Jennifer. With Mark's assistance, Jennifer applied for a German visa, but it was initially denied. They appealed the denial, but finally, 10 days before Jennifer lost her life, the German government contacted Mark to let him know that Jennifer's visa was approved. It was a joyous occasion for the couple and wedding planning soon commenced. Jennifer had even purchased a wedding dress and the wedding was planned for the spring. Sadly, it was a wedding that didn't come to fruition. After Jennifer's death, Private First Class Pemberton was being held aboard the USS Peleliu. Now bear with me while I run through some dates. On October 17th, six days after Jennifer Lede was murdered, a subpoena for Pemberton was ordered to the U.S. Embassy in Manila. The ship remained on lockdown in Subic Bay. Pemberton did not show up at the Alangapo City Prosecutor's Office on October 21st. Instead, his attorney, Rowena Garcia Flores, was there, and she argued that the subpoena did not require him to attend the hearing in person. The following day, October 22nd, Pemberton was flown on a helicopter to the Joint United States Military Advisory Group. It was a compound which is inside the Armed Forces of the Philippines facility in Camp Aguinaldo in Quezon City. That same day, Mark Sesselback, Jennifer's fiance, and Marilou Lede, one of Jennifer's sisters, well, they climbed a fence trespassing onto Camp Aguinaldo, trying to get a glimpse of Pemberton. They wanted to confront the man who killed their loved one. But they didn't make it very far, although Mark did get handsy with a cop before he was forcibly removed from the installation. But Mark would find himself in more hot water after this incident. He was actually deported back to Germany and blacklisted and prevented from returning to the Philippines. Of the ban, Mark simply said, quote, they're banning me from the Philippines for disrespect and gross arrogance. Yet they're protecting the man who murdered my wife just because he's American, end quote. As soon as Pemberton was off the USS Peleliu, they pushed off and left the port. They were heading to Okinawa. Jennifer Lede's funeral was on October 24th. She was buried at the Heritage Memorial Park in Alangapo City. But Jennifer's death was not in vain. Her death started a movement that would become known as National Day of Outrage. LGBT organizations all over the Philippines held candlelight vigils in quiet protest against the treatment of transgender people in their country. Others refused to stay silent and were more vocal. One group staged a protest where they attempted to carry a mock coffin to the U.S. Embassy in Manila. Jennifer's death and the protest that followed brought LGBTQ plus issues into the media's attention. Many of you might not know this, but while LGBTQ plus people is a normal part of the Filipino society, they do not have similar rights as those offered in the U.S. For example, Anti-discrimination laws in the U.S. would allow the murder of Jennifer to be qualified as a hate crime, potentially. Not so much in the Philippines. The Philippines did not have anti-discriminatory laws that protect LGBT like other countries do. On October 27th, Joseph Pemberton's lawyer, Miss Flores, she filed a motion to dismiss the murder charge, claiming there was no probable cause to believe Jennifer's death was the result of murder. That motion was swiftly rejected on November 3rd. On December 15th, the Alangapo City Prosecutor's Office filed capital murder charges against Pemberton. The qualifying circumstances to make this a capital case 
were treachery, abuse of superior strength, and cruelty. The following day, a bench warrant was issued and the Philippine government demanded that they take Pemberton into custody. But I am sure the U.S. dragged their feet until December 19th, when Pemberton finally surrendered himself and was booked into Philippine custody. On December 22nd, Pemberton's lawyers reinstated their request to dismiss the murder charge or, in the alternative, downgrade the charge. On January 27th, 2015, the Department of Justice affirmed the charge of murder against Pemberton based on the existence of probable cause. Then, on February 20th, after refusing to enter his own plea, the court entered a not guilty plea on Joseph Pemberton's behalf. Trial was set for March 23rd. During this time, basically since he was transferred off of the Peleliu in October, Private First Class Pemberton was being held on Camp Aguinaldo in a 20-foot air-conditioned van and it was guarded by a rotation of U.S. Marines. This maintained the VFA's provision that the U.S. maintain custody until legal proceedings were complete. So he was basically on house arrest, at least that's how I see it. In an attempt at a PR campaign, Pemberton's mother, Lisa Pemberton, she told reporters with a trembling voice and through tears that it's been very difficult. He's always been our angel, she said. She also said, I know Joseph would rather die for his country than be in this situation. At trial, the prosecutor's first witness was Elias Galamos, who was the front desk clerk at the Cell Zone Lodge, who found Jennifer's body. Elias testified that the defendant, Joseph, was the white man who checked into room one with Jennifer and then left alone 30 minutes later. Barbie testified after being in the witness protection program since October. Her testimony filled in the timeline before she and Jennifer arrived at Cell Zone Lodge. She told the court that she and Jennifer, along with the three other friends, they had been at Ambayance looking for dates. She and Jennifer moved to a table near the door and together they saw the four Americans walk in. She said that Jennifer approached one of them and after a brief conversation, she and the American wanted to leave Ambayance and go to the cell zone. The trio walked across the street to the motel and from there she testified that she left Pemberton alone with Jennifer and went to room five with a man. After Elias came and told her that Jennifer had fainted, she rushed down to room one and pushed her way past the police to look at Jennifer's body. When she exited the motel room, she saw the other three Americans and told them that she knew that their friend killed her friend. Jacinto Miraflor testified next that he guarded room one while Elias went to get police. Lance Corporal Jaron Rose testified to the events of the day on October 11th when he, Joseph Pemberton, and the two other Marines went into Alangapo City on Liberty. He talked about how the four Marines went to lunch, they got massages, they went to the Willis Bar for about three hours, and then they ended up at Ambayance. Okay, so hold on a second. Did they actually get massages or did they get massages? I mean, this is just nuts. Anyway, Rose also testified that after Ambayance, he went with somebody to a different hotel room. Jaron Rose further testified that after he left the hotel room with whoever he was with, he started looking for the other three Marines. He said that he found Pulido and Dahl, but couldn't find Pemberton. He was getting really nervous about breaking curfew. And when Barbie was saying she thought their friend killed her friend, they quick jumped into a taxi and returned to the ship. That's when they got chewed out and Pemberton arrived in his very own taxi. And not long after that, Pemberton confessed. Corporal Miller testified as well, corroborating Rose's testimony. The next witnesses for the prosecution were doctors that testified to the condition of Jennifer's body and the mechanism of injury. They also unequivocally confirmed their autopsy findings that Jennifer was strangled and drowned. The last witness for the prosecution was Jennifer's mom. She testified that after learning about Jennifer's death, she didn't eat or sleep for two weeks. Besides the emotional toll it took on her, she talked about the financial toll. For every day that Jennifer laid in state, it cost her 1,500 pesos per day. That was a lot of money for her after Jennifer had been supporting her for so many years. The prosecution rested their case and the defense called their first witness. And wouldn't you know it, it was private first class Pemberton himself. On the stand for the first time ever, we heard his defense. 
He claimed he accidentally killed Jennifer in self-defense. He also claimed that Jennifer was alive and well when he left her, so someone else must have entered the room and murdered her. Which honestly, this doesn't make any sense. You either killed her in self-defense or she was alive and someone else killed her. It can't be both. So this is how Pemberton explained what happened on the stand. The three guys went to the mall, they went to get lunch, and they ended up at Ambayad's. Pemberton said that as soon as he walked into the bar, Barbie and Jennifer walked up to him looking sexy as hell with revealing outfits. He thought they were both pretty. They asked him if he wanted sex, although apparently they used more crude language. And Pemberton was like, hell yeah, that sounds good. Once they knew that Pemberton was DTF, and if you watch the Jersey Shore, you know exactly what that acronym means. They grabbed him by the hand and dragged him across the street to the cell zone. They asked for a room, but Pemberton said no one paid for the actual room. Then they went to room one. While in room one, the girls told him he had to pay each of them 1,000 pesos. He testified he didn't complain at all. He simply removed his wallet and paid the money. As soon as he paid, he said Barbie went into the bathroom and Jennifer pulled down his pants and started performing oral sex on him. Then, when Barbie exited the bathroom, the girls changed places. Barbie performed oral sex on Pemberton and Jennifer entered the bathroom. After a few minutes, Barbie asked Pemberton for more money so Jennifer could buy condoms. Joseph told Barbie that he had condoms so there was no need to buy more. But Barbie insisted and ended up grabbing his wallet. He snatched it back and gave her 200 pesos. Barbie took the money and then left the room. Just as Barbie left, Pemberton claimed that Jennifer came out of the bathroom wearing nothing but a towel tied around her waist. He said Jennifer got on the bed and started giving him oral sex again. He said that when he went to reach for her vagina, he discovered she had a penis. Joseph claimed that this caused Jennifer to recoil away from him. He testified that he was disgusted, told her to get off him and move to the edge of the bed. He claims that Jennifer stood up and slapped him across the face hard enough that his ear was ringing. Joseph testified that Jennifer was winding up to slap him again, so he hit her first. Pemberton's punch prompted an exchange of hits and punches between the two of them. At some point, he got his arm around Jennifer's neck and they fell back on the bed. Joseph held Jennifer in a headlock until she went limp. He said he brought her into the shower to splash water on her, but there was no running water. Pemberton said that he dropped her on the floor naked, he got dressed, and left calmly because he didn't want to attract any unwanted attention from the hotel staff. He said that he took a cab back to the ship and that when he left, Jennifer was still breathing. He claimed he did not stuff her head into the toilet. He insisted that someone else must have come into the room and done that to Jennifer. The defense's next witness was Joseph's mom, Lisa. She tried to establish that her son was loving and compassionate, kind-hearted and God-fearing and incapable of committing the crime of murder. She also said that one of her daughters is a lesbian and that it never affected Joseph negatively. The defense wrapped up its witnesses with a forensic pathologist expert witness. Dr. Raquel Fortune noted that she felt there was insufficient evidence that Jennifer drowning was the cause of death. She testified that in her professional opinion, Jennifer's sole cause of death was asphyxiation due to pressure on the neck. Well, on November 18th, 2015, the court had a verdict. About 100 riot police faced 200 protesters outside the courthouse in Alangapo. They were all waiting for the verdict. The court announced that Joseph Scott Pemberton was guilty of the charge of homicide, not murder. The sentence was quickly announced along with the verdict. He was to serve six to 12 years with credit for the time he had already served. After the verdict was announced, the crowd was, you know, pleasantly surprised and they dispersed. But the court wasn't done. They also ordered Pemberton to pay Julita, Jennifer's mom, damages totaling 50,000 pesos as civil indemnity, 4,320,000 pesos for loss of earning capacity, 155,250 pesos for reimbursement for the 15-day wake and burial expenses, and 3,000 pesos exemplary damages. In total, the damages were just under 80,000 U.S. dollars. 
the court determined that Jennifer Lede died due to asphyxiation by drowning. They dismissed the defense's expert pathologist testimony. The only conclusion the court could come to as to who killed Jennifer was that it was Pemberton. They determined that he was liar, liar, pants on fire when he claimed that Jennifer was still alive when he left. If his ear was ringing and he was injured, they questioned why didn't Pemberton go seek medical attention? His claims that Jennifer was breathing when he left means that there was a third person that came in and killed her. Except Elias and Jacinto, the employees at the cell zone lodge, they testified that no one entered or exited that room without them seeing it. But the biggest thing of all is let's not forget that Pemberton confessed to the two other Marines that he killed someone and effed up real bad. Joseph Scott Pemberton was ordered to serve his time at New Bilibib Prison, which is the largest detention facility in the Philippines. Time magazine reported that more than 26,000 convicts live in squalor here. There's no air conditioner, there's deplorable conditions, and it's jam-packed up in that prison. When the time came for Pemberton to be taken to the prison, he was surrounded by a dozen Marines who refused to allow him to be taken by the Philippine government. A standoff ensued while the officials in Alangapo City and the U.S. military, well, they worked out a deal. It continued until about 7 p.m. when the judge finally ordered Pemberton to be taken back to Camp Aguinaldo, where he had been held since October of 2014. It turns out that this was the second time a U.S. Marine had been convicted of a felony in the Philippines since the U.S. bases closed in the early 1990s and the second time since that time that Filipinos were outraged over an incarceration plan. You see, in 2006, Marine Lance Corporal Daniel Smith was convicted of raping a Filipino woman, and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Except he never served a day in a Philippine jail. Like Pemberton, Smith was held by U.S. authorities. In his case, he was held at the U.S. Embassy in Manila, rather than the prison he was supposed to go to. But I digress. Let's put a pin in Smith's case. We'll get back to it in a little bit. Joseph Pemberton's defense team filed for bail in December of 2015, which was denied by the courts. The court opinion I reviewed meticulously picked apart every piece of defense that they presented. The court did accept a few mitigating circumstances, and they ended up lowering Pemberton's maximum sentence to 10 years from 12. But they upheld the financial award for damages. Pemberton filed an appeal with the Philippines Supreme Court. The Supreme Court reviewed Pemberton's case in April of 2016. They affirmed the lower court's ruling and dismissed the petition. Pemberton was serving his time in the Joint United States Military Advisory Group compound, which is inside the armed forces of the Philippines facility in Camp Aguinalda in Quezon City. This was the location he was brought to after he was transferred off the USS Peleliu. His incarceration in an air-conditioned trailer was felt as an outrage to Philippine citizens who felt he should be held in one of their prisons. And then, on February 11, 2020, the Philippine president, Rodrigo Duterte, announced that it was giving notice to the United States that it intended to withdraw from the VFA. If withdrawn, it would mean that Joseph Scott Pemberton would be moved to that high-risk Philippine prison that I described earlier. And then, out of nowhere, in September 2020, a Philippine court ordered Pemberton should be released early for good conduct. Jennifer's family immediately protested and appealed. And in a show of solidarity, the Philippine president's office announced that it would submit a separate appeal. But on September 7th, the president's office shocked the world when it announced that it was granting Pemberton a complete, I repeat, a complete, which means an absolute pardon. Excuse me, what? Yes, a full pardon. Upon hearing of his release, Joseph Scott Pemberton was quoted saying, quote, I am very happy. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. Ugh. Anyway, the Laude family lawyer told the press that Pemberton's pardon was revolting and that it makes a mockery of the judicial and legal systems in the Philippines. On September 13, 2020, at exactly 9.14 a.m., Joseph Scott Pemberton boarded a military transport heading for the U.S. and freedom. He was technically deported and blacklisted, but I doubt that he would ever want to return back to the Philippines. Through his legal team, Pemberton issued a goodbye message stating he was extremely grateful to the Philippine president. 
He did, however, express his most sincere sympathy to Jennifer Laudet's family. Over the six whole years he was confined, I can't even call it incarceration because it, you know, it really wasn't. It was like house arrest. Pemberton claimed that he spent much time contemplating the many errors that he made the night Jennifer Laudet died. The end of his farewell message read, quote, he wishes he had the words to express the depth of his sorrow and regret, end quote. The pardon sparked more protests like the ones that had been held in 2014 when Jennifer Laudet was first murdered. In a statement regarding the pardon, Christine Palabe, who at the time was the secretary general of the left-wing activist group Carapatan, said, quote, It is a hard slap on the LGBTQ community and a blatant affront to our national sovereignty, end quote. By the end of July 2021, the Philippine president retracted the letter and restored the VFA in full force. Then Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin met with the president of the Philippines and expressed his gratitude in reconfirming the alliance between the two countries. Okay, remember when I talked about Lance Corporal Daniel Smith being the first Marine convicted of a felony in the Philippines since the bases had closed in the 90s? Well... I also mentioned that the people were outraged by his incarceration plan. And wait for it. Daniel Smith was also released and returned to the United States. He wasn't pardoned by the Philippine president, though. The Philippine Appeals Court actually overturned the rape conviction in 2009 after the victim recanted her story. It should be noted that the rape victim or the alleged rape victim was granted an American visa and residency and a settlement of about 100,000 pesos. As soon as the victim recanted, the court reversed Smith's conviction and sent him packing to the U.S. less than 24 hours later. One article in the Asian Journal stated that Pemberton would not be court-martialed by the Marines once he was back in the United States. I was unable to get a copy of his discharge paperwork So I continue to wonder if Pemberton got an honorable discharge or something less. I was also not able to find any credible information about what he is doing at the moment. Of note, the articles that talked about his pardon and deportation referred to him as Lance Corporal Pemberton, which leads me to believe that he was promoted during his incarceration. Because remember, he was a private first class when he killed Jennifer Laudet. Shout out to everyone who has recommended this case over the years and for allowing us to keep Jennifer in our thoughts. I don't care what color you vote, human rights are human rights and they should be upheld. Thank you all for joining me for another episode of Military Murder. If you want to continue to hear more stories, please subscribe by clicking the plus or check mark in whatever app you're listening on. That will ensure you never miss an episode and it's completely free. Shout out to Myrtle for researching and writing this episode for me. The sources for this episode include court opinions from the Republic of the Philippines, Court of Appeals, and Supreme Court, an Amazon Prime documentary titled Call Her Ganda, and articles in the New York Times, Vice.com, Stars and Stripes, Time Magazine, Marine Corps Times, Asian Journal, USA Today, the U.S. Department of Defense, and NationalPublicRadio.org. This show was created by Mama Margot Productions and produced by all of my boot camp and higher fan club members. The music was created by TIOPS. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next time. I was working on our podcast. I don't want to.